Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Pfeffer. I'm the managing editor of DICE, and we're here today with Leslie Stevens Huffman, who's a career writer and a, a frequent contributor to DICE. And today we're going to talk about complex hiring processes, which sounds kind of weird because you'd think that every hiring process was complex. But some of them are more complicated than others. And what we're really going to focus on are the processes that have five or six steps, can involve multiple interviewers, multiple technical screens, and probably more candidates than you'd, you'd really expect to find in a competing for a tech job today. So Leslie, welcome and thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Sure. So let's start by talking about this complex process. And why don't you sort of step us through it very briefly, but also tell us about why it's important to understand the process before you actually begin it yourself. Right. Well, certainly it's important, Mark, because, you know, you can prepare ahead of time um, and you kind of know what to expect. Uh, and it also gives you a chance, I think, as a candidate to really show that you're interested in working for the company. And companies have long hiring processes, not only because they want to find the best candidate, but because they want to find the candidate who really wants to work there. So, it, you know, to a certain extent, it's a little bit of an endurance test uh, for IT professionals. And you're talking about, when you, when you talk about understanding the process shows the company that you want to work there, are you talking about the fact that you're comfortable with the process or you understand where the company's coming from um, or what do you mean by that? Well, I think, you know, it, it's both. It's certainly understanding where the company is, um, you know, kind of coming from, but it helps you adapt and, and ask intelligent questions as you go through the process and prepare, you know, your answers and things like that before you uh, go into an interview or a technical screen. All right. So let's let's sort of skip the resume process in our, our discussion because we all sort of know what that's like and that's not really a personal part of the process. But the the actual interaction with the company really begins when you have to go through the initial phone screen. So right. what's that about? How do you what should you be thinking about when you get on the phone with them for the first time? Right. Well the company's goal at that point is really to identify the candidates who have the basic, uh, excuse me, the must-have requirements. Those would be the ones listed in the top third of the job description. So at that point, they're asking about your experience with Python or big data, whatever it is, big data sets, things of that nature. From a, uh, your perspective, from the candidate's perspective, what you want to do is prepare examples and be ready to talk about your experience. Um, and then you want to do two other things. You want to be sure and ask what the next steps are. And you want to be ready to sort of sidestep any landmines like asking about your salary requirements and so on. You want to be ready for some of those uh, initial questions and bond with the interviewer. How do you sidestep a question about salary? Well, the, the key is to, you know, do things like use ranges or kind of turn that around a little bit and say, well, you know, I know the market uh, rate for somebody in this position is, you know, anywhere from 70 to 90,000. Um, does that sound like something that would work within your, you know, your, is that within your range? Okay. So that way you're not putting a specific number out there right away. Now, when you're, when you're done with the initial phone screen, which is, is probably going to be done by the recruiter or HR, right. do, do you follow up with one of those or do you just wait for them? I mean, I would imagine you, you make some kind of follow-up. Absolutely. That's why you want to ask what's the next step and when will, you, when will you hear. And if they say, well, you should hear something in a couple of days and you don't hear, you should follow up. In either uh, event, if you don't hear anything within about five business days, I would follow up. Okay. So what comes next? So usually if you've made it past the initial phone screen, the next thing they want to do is verify your technical skills. And the reason they want to do that is they really don't want to invest a lot of time in face-to-face -face interviews with candidates who, you know, maybe don't have what they're looking for in that uh, from a technical standpoint. So it could be, you know, they could give you an online coding test. Uh, they could give you a small project to work on. Or the famous whiteboard exam uh, could be coming up next with the engineering staff. But won't you have to go through some preliminary interviews before you get to that point? 
Um, you know, they may meet you. It, it, nothing is set in stone. Um, but generally speaking, if you've passed the initial phone screen, uh, a lot of times they want it, they want to get into your technical skills next. So um, they may do a quick meet and greet with you. Um, and then, like I say, give you the code test, coding test. Some companies will just, if they're doing an online coding test, that's the very next thing that's going to happen. Uh, is they're going to give you some instructions to log in, or they may send you an online questionnaire, something mm -hmm. like that. And I'd, I'd imagine that um, you don't just get one of these. I mean, if you're going to go through an online technical test of some sort, or you're going to go through a, a quick interview and then have to do a whiteboard interview, is it fair to think that at every step of the way, uh, in terms of multiple interviews, that you might face some kind of technical challenges at every one of those steps? Absolutely. First of all, every interviewer is going to want to sort of confirm for, the, for themselves that you have what you say you have. But secondly, if they had any questions maybe about your skills or you interview with people with different areas of expertise, they, they could certainly be asking you those kinds of questions. So, um, you know, sometimes there's a question about, well, gee, you know, was, was Mark really um, proficient with Python in this regard? And, and so they'll ask you about it as you go through. They'll keep, they'll keep doing that. But generally, once they have your technical skills, you know, pretty sure you have them, then they're going to want to see if you're a good environmental, cultural fit, you know, do you fit with the team? Mm -hmm. Let's let's stick with the technical, um, the technical aspect sure. for a minute because, you know, you've got a background in technology, you know, maybe you've been doing it for, you know, whatever, even if you're an entry level, you've probably been doing it, you know, in, in college, but, you know, if you're, you're older than that, you've been doing it for five years, ten years, are they only going to rely on their technical assessments, their their whiteboard um, tests, um, their technology interviews to sort of suss, suss out your skills, or are they going to be looking in other places too? Well, they could certainly, absolutely, they'll be checking you out, you know, what, what coding samples you have on GitHub, um, you know, some other code sharing sites that are out there. Um, they'll look at anything you give them, if you give them some coding samples or you know, if you're a web developer, if you give them a link to your portfolio, they'll definitely check that out. And, you know, they're going to run your name. As you start to become a more serious candidate, they're going to run your name by other people they know. Um, so, for example, if somebody on the, the team says, oh, you know, hey, he, you know, Mark used to work over at XYZ Company, and I know somebody over there. Mm -hmm. They're going to, you know, they're going to call up and say, hey, you know, how good was Mark? You know, what did he know? So they're going to be doing some things in the background, too, um, you know, to sort of check you out and, and see if they're comfortable with your technical skills, besides what you do in the whiteboard exam. Okay. Uh, we all know in the whiteboard exam what they really want to see is how you think. You know, they don't expect you to have it all right, but they do want you to sort of walk them through your problem-solving steps. Can you talk more about that? Because one of the complaints that I see a lot um, from tech professionals and, and programmers especially is that, um, well, first of all, they don't, they don't like whiteboard tests, but secondly, they say they're inherently unfair right. uh, because it's hard to get to the right answer in that kind of environment. Uh, but it, it's not really about the right answer. No, it isn't. And, you know, I hear the same thing over and over again from the engineers that, that administer the tests. And they, they tell me a couple of things. First of all, they say, you know, we give the IT professionals so many hints up front about what we're looking for. And we understand they're nervous, but they don't always listen. And secondly, we're willing to share some tips if they get stuck because we realize that it's kind of a pressure-packed environment. Um, but what we really want them to do is just walk us through the steps. You know, what what are you thinking? What they want, they want to get inside your head, you know. They want to hear what you're thinking about as you're trying to solve the problem. How would you approach this kind of a problem? Um, have you ever seen it before? What did you do? And... You know, if you don't know the answer, say, well, you know, I don't know, but here's how, here's where I'd look. And, you know, I believe they're, they're serious because they, they also claim that they don't always hire the candidate that gets the highest technical score. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think, you know, as long as you can do that, I mean, certainly you have to, you know, review um, certification exams and practice and, and do some things to get ready. Um, but I think you shouldn't fear, you know, being stumped unless every single question stumps you. Don't, don't let one or two questions throw you off. Okay. Um, now, once you've made it past the technical assessment and we've, we've talked about how you might face multiple technical assess, assessments. Absolutely. Let's, let's talk about the interviews themselves, not, not only the technical interviews, but the general interviews that you'll have with the team, with hiring managers, with, you know, other, um, other of their colleagues throughout the, uh, throughout the company. Sure. Why are they bothering with those if, if they've figured out at this point that you're technically competent? Right. Um, why are they bothering to talk to you more? Right. Well, now, now their focus is really on that environmental fit, that cultural fit. Do you, will you get along with the team? You know, is this a good place for you to work? Will you be able to deal with the way they make decisions there? You know, are you an innovative spirit or free spirit, those kinds of things. So they're going to be asking you uh, a lot of times behavioral questions. And this is also when, you know, you might meet with the members of the team. You might have coffee or lunch with them. Um, there's usually several ways that they want to just sort of get to know you as a person. Now, to your point earlier, that doesn't mean they won't sneak in a technical question every now and then. You've got to keep you on your toes. Mm -hmm. But generally, at this point, they're just trying to get to know you. Um, and they're trying to say, you know, hey, is this, is this a guy or a gal I can, you know, work with every day? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's what they're doing. And of course, you as you should be doing that too as the candidate, right? Because you're not going to be at your best if you're uncomfortable working somewhere, or it's not what you had in mind. Maybe you had some specific goals in mind. You know, you wanted to be in a um, a more fast-paced development environment, or you wanted to have more freedom to to do different things. So this is a, a you know, it should be a good two-way dialogue at this point, and uh, everybody's looking for that comfort level. How do you prepare for those kind of interviews, though? I mean, you know, you can pre prepare yourself technically for the technical challenges, yeah. but when you're going in and talking about the workplace, the culture, you know, meeting the team to see how you get along, you know, is there is there preparation that you can do, or is it a question of going in and just being yourself? Well, I, I mean, I definitely think you, you need to be yourself, but... Um, I do think you have to prepare too. And the best way to do that is to uh, think about some of the behavioral questions that you might be asked and prepare examples. Because it's, if you have those ahead of time, you're going to be a lot more comfortable when the questions come up. Um, you know, they're, they're going to ask you questions about well, what did you do, you know, when, when um, you know, you were, had a technical problem you couldn't solve or you know, what do you do when you have a stakeholder who can't, you know, make up their mind about the requirements or things like that? They're going to ask you those kind of questions. So being prepared for that really helps. And, of course, you want to have your own questions ready that you want to ask um, because that shows that you're interested and that, you know, those are important things you want to know. Let me, let me ask, let's just step back for a second to behavioral questions. We hear a lot about those, but... What, what is isn't a behavioral question? And, and, you know, give us a couple of examples. Right. A behavioral question essentially asks you, it gives you a situation or a scenario and asks you what you would do. Uh, it, theoretically, it's supposed to point back to something you've done in the past. So you say, you know, what did you do? What have you done in the past when you encountered um, a stakeholder who wouldn't give you clear um, direction or scope of work or who kept changing the requirements throughout the project. What did you do? And so what they're looking for is, well, how do you go about solving problems? How do you work with somebody who's maybe difficult or tough? Um, so they, once again, they're trying to get inside your head mm -hmm. um, because the idea is if you say, well, you know, the first thing I do is I, you know, try to maybe get them out to a one-on-one -on -one meeting and try to talk to them a little bit more or ask them how I can, you know, work with them to get, you know, make this better. And then eventually if it doesn't get better, I'd go to my project manager and, 
so they're trying to see what's your problem solving methodology. You know, is this person sort of a loose cannon? You know, are you going to go to the stakeholder and start pounding on the desk or are you going to, you know, what's your approach to those kind of problems? So that's why having those examples is good because you can be comfortable giving an example. Okay. Now, you also were talking about how this is a good time to be asking questions of your own. I think most people don't realize that it, this is a perfectly okay thing to do and that, in fact, you really should be sort of interviewing them just as they're interviewing you. Right. It's a two-way street, you know. So if, if, you know, if things are really important to you, you want to ask about them. You know, for example, uh, if you're really interested in moving up the ladder, you want to ask about, you know, tell me about your promotional opportunities or how many people you've promoted internally or what your policy is. Um, or if you really want to work with cutting edge technology or you want to get, um, you know, some more training or growth. Um, you know, do you, you might want to ask at this point, you know, how do you train your internal staff on new tools when they come out? Um, you know, are you thinking about going to the latest release of a, of a new program or a new language? Um, you know, are you uh, open to putting other languages into the stack? You know, things like that. Um, things that, you know, you had on your wish list when you started looking for a job. Um, how, do, how do employers react to that? Are they expecting you to ask questions? Would they rather you didn't? Um, I think some people might kind of be afraid that they don't want to appear like they're interrogating the... Uh, the hiring manager or something like that. So, so what's the employer's expectations? You know, the employer expects you to ask questions, just like they ask you, to, they expect you to ask about the hiring process from the outset, because to them that shows interest. And it also shows that, you know, you're considering this decision carefully. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they want you to ask, and certainly, you know, you don't want it to seem like an inquisition. <laughs> But hopefully, you know, if you get a chance with one of the things about the longer hiring process, even though it can be frustrating to IT professionals, mm -hmm. it is going to give you more opportunities to ask questions. It is going to give you a chance to get to know the, the uh, folks on the other side of the table a little bit more. And then both parties are hopefully going to be more comfortable kind of opening up and asking those kind of questions. So if you ask open-ended questions, by the way, that invites them to talk more and they may answer a lot of your questions without you having to sort of, you know, jab at them too much. Are there, say, three questions that you should make sure to ask or any number of questions that you may, should make sure to ask? Well, I mean, I would definitely ask things uh, about the environment. How do they describe it? Um, you know, what are your expectations of someone in my role? I think that's really important um, and the reason being is that tells you whether or not you're going to be successful there. Um, and, and I think the third thing you really want to ask is, you know, um, you know, tell me about some of the people who have, who have done the best here, who have really excelled, you know, what, what has been their key to success and tell me about some of the people who haven't done well here. Um, I think a lot, if you are comfortable and you're in the right environment and the expectations aren't unreasonable, I think you're going to do so much better. I think then all the money and all the other things that you want will often follow. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are good things. And certainly you want to ask about the technology and, and you know, how much are they willing to invest or how much have they been investing? Kind of where are they? Um, because I, I think that it has a lot to do with, how happy you're going to be and how marketable you'll be. Now, this is also the time that you really have to be prepared for the compensation question because you're going to get it when you get uh, when you get this far, aren't you? Absolutely. Um, if it's once it starts getting close to an offer stage, uh, money's going to come up, um, and they may you know, do a little fishing to see what your expectations are. They may throw out, as they call it, like the trial balloon. You know, well, if we were to offer you, say, you know, a salary of about 85000 what would you think about that? You know, they might do some things like that. Um, so, yeah, you have to have researched the market, 
Um, you need to know, that's why I also mentioned about the expectations because that's really important, right? Are they going to be working you 60 hours a week or is this a company that has better work-life balance? Mm -hmm. um, you may be willing to take a little bit less if you're going to get some new technical skills out of, out of your you know, employment there. So that's why I suggested those things too because that helps you start thinking about, well, how much money am I going to ask for? And how much money do I think this, you know, this job is, is worth? I mean, what am I worth and what's the job worth? But so, you know, we, we started this off saying this was going to be about a complex hiring process, but really what we've been talking about is almost a typical hiring process. What, what are the dynamics do you think that, that turn the whole thing into, into something that's more complicated? Um, is it the pressure? Is it, is it, um, because they're under time constraint, they're really pushing you to make a decision. Is it because there's more candidates involved? Um, what what is sort of the the clue that tells you there's a bit more than the usual going on here? Well, I, I think all of the things that you mentioned, but I I think to the number of steps that they have and how long it it takes them to go through the, the hiring process. Um, if the company's really in a hurry to get somebody on board or they're having trouble finding folks, they may they won't reduce the number of steps in the hiring process, but they may just speed up the time between the steps so they don't lose you as a candidate. But generally speaking, that that complex hiring process, that four to five steps, that can take anywhere from five weeks to as, as long as 10 weeks. Hmm. So, you know, you may have to kind of make it through a lot of gates, right? You've got to do an online coding test, then you got to come in and talk with the engineers. I mean, all those things I think make it complicated. Um, then you've got to do three or four in-person interviews, and then maybe they're going to run the final step once they give you an offer, they're going to give you a background check, run a background check on you, and um, do some other final screening. So uh, I think it's, it's the number of steps and the amount of time it takes can really make it complex. And you remember each person you're meeting with, there's like, you know, there's some politics going on behind that. Um, everybody may have a, a different favorite candidate. So those kind of things make it a little bit more complicated too. When, when you said, you just said um, something about some more screening, some final screening, what, what kind of screening are they going to do at the end? Usually at the end, once they put the offer out, that's when they're going to run a background check. And that could be, you know, certainly your criminal background and your credit and your driving record, things like that. Um, they'll probably call some of your prior employers and perhaps ask you for some references. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a number of things they're, they're going to do, you know, it, kind of backing up here for a second. Initially, they'll probably check you out on the internet before they even, you know, call you for that first interview. They may look on GitHub or they may check you out on social media, LinkedIn, things like that. Okay. But down the road, um, when they're really getting serious, especially a large company, that's when they're going to, you know, pay a background investigation company to, you know, kind of make sure everything's in order and all your information is, is lines up. Okay. Well, Leslie, thank you. Thank you. Good luck to everybody out there. I hope it was helpful. It's, I think what we've seen is that a, a, even a complicated hiring process has a certain methodology to it and it may be more some subtle clues about how complex the process is versus a, a, a more routine if there is such a thing, a uh, process of getting onboarded. If you have questions about all this, feel free to email us to editor at dice.com and we'll be sure to get an answer back to you. In the meantime, watch out for our next Hangout. We'll be posting, uh, posting the date and time of that as soon as we have it. In the meantime, Leslie Stevens Hoffman, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I'm Mark Pfeffer, the managing editor of Dice, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.